Spring is over and the transfer portal is coming to a close. So now that we know the roster and saw the depth chart, how can Texas utilize their offensive players to rack up the wins? Ian Boyd of Inside Texas stops by so we can preview how the Texas offense will look in the upcoming season. Make sure to head over to Inside Texas to be in the loop on all things Texas football. You won't miss a thing with excellent coverage from all angles. Do yourself a favor and sign up today at InsideTexas.com. New quarterbacks, new receivers, new tight ends, and new offensive linemen. How can we deploy them to put stress on opposing Big 12 defenses? Without further ado, let's get into it. Welcome back, Ian. First, so we know what we're up against. Overall, how should opposing Big 12 defenses look this upcoming year? And then who are your top defenses heading into the season? Uh, The Big 12, I think, is going to take a step back on defense next season. One thing that makes for a good defense in today's game is having a lot of experience in the secondary. And a lot of Big 12 teams have been benefiting from the COVID year to steal extra seasons from seniors. It's already so a very developmentally driven league. The best, like Oklahoma State's best teams in general, Kansas State, these teams that win on the margins, they're usually really good when they have a lot of fifth-year seniors involved in their lineup. Last year, there was a lot of teams that had sixth-year seniors across their defense that knew how to, they had seen everything, they knew how to do everything, and it gave them a ton of versatility and a ton of awareness of Big 12 offenses and what they wanted to do. A lot of those guys are now gone. Across the league, we're going to see a lot of teams take a step back. I think the best teams are going to be the ones that have proven pass rush from their defensive line so that they can get pressure with minimal blitzing that's going to help them as they reshore up their back end. Kansas State and Iowa State are both way up there because they return Felix and Adike Uzuma at Kansas State and Will McDonald at Iowa State both had 10 plus sacks last year. Oklahoma State as well. They have um, Oliver Back who had 10 sacks last year as a freshman. And then they have two edge players ahead of that were ahead of him on the depth chart last year before they got hurt. So they have this abundance of pass rushers that'll help them because they have to replace six out of seven starters on the back end at Oklahoma State. Then the next category would be like uh, Texas, Baylor, and Texas Tech that have some good pieces up front. Um, and in the instance of Texas, they have good defensive backs in the back. Those teams are all going to have to kind of figure it out. We'll kind of see how they come together. I think the, the surest bets are Iowa State, Kansas State, and Oklahoma State because they know we can get pressure without going crazy. So we can make things as simple and easy as possible for all of our fresh meat for the grinder in the back end. Good stuff. And now we know who to look out for and what our offense is facing. Looking at individual position groups, if Quinn is the starting quarterback, what skills does he bring to the table? And then how does that inform how the offense will look? Quinn Ewers is a generational passing talent. We're talking about a uh, Trevor Lawrence kind of player. When you look at like the highest rated quarterbacks in history, it's always guys that have just unreal, outstanding physical talent. There have been a few like that. Vince Young is an obvious one. He's not Vince Young. Justin Fields was another one. And then Trevor Lawrence was one of the main ones that I think he's probably closest to Trevor Lawrence and of those like big three modern spread quarterbacks that were rated extremely highly and then panned out pretty quickly. He can make throws on the field that most quarterbacks can't make, especially in college. He can make throws on the field that a lot of NFL quarterbacks, maybe even most NFL quarterbacks can't make. Very different level of uh, throwing talent. For whatever reason, his body, when he flicks his arm, it just flies pretty true. And it flies a long distance and it gets there pretty quickly. Um, he also has a lot of touch. He's not just uh, He's not just rifling it in and knocking people over like on those old, you know, fake Michael Vick commercials where he's like knocking people over and turning out of the stadium. He always, has, he always has the ability to place the ball and throw it with touch and make it more catchable. So he's obviously, he's inexperienced. He hasn't played a game of college yet. He didn't play his senior year of high school, maybe a little overblown because he started at South Lake Carroll as a freshman, sophomore, and junior. So he's not missing reps in the same way that another player would if he missed his senior year. But we haven't seen it in college games yet, but we can at least know that he generally knows where the ball goes. And if Sark can scheme it up where he knows where the ball is supposed to go and he has enough time to get it there, then he can open up angles and change the geometry of the game uh, for the offense. Yeah, his arm talent is special, man. And then we also have Card in the mix as well. And Card is good in the middle of the field RPO game. He can turn his hips fast and get it there like a second baseman. So what do you see in Card's skill set? And how does the quarterback's differences change the possible path of Sarkeesian's offense? 
Hudson Card is kind of like a, an uber version of a classic Big 12 quarterback. Um, and by that, I mean a guy who's pretty savvy, athletic, can move around, throw on the move. The second baseman analogy is, is perfect. We could probably, we could say shortstop too, because he's he's got a strong arm. Uh, so we can, we'll just move him over like one spot. I think he'd be at his best in, um, honestly, he'd probably be at his best in an offense like the 2008, 2009 Colt McCoy offenses. Now Colt McCoy didn't have a rifle arm, but he was very accurate throwing deep. So he could make a three-step drop, throw a fade to Quan Cosby, throw a double move to Jordan Shipley and burn you. Um, he wasn't going to put it 75 yards down the field, but he could get it out and on time and in the ac- in accurately. So they did have a deep passing game enough to open up uh, McCoy to throw option routes and quick routes underneath all day and have space to do it because teams couldn't just uh, crowd up. So Hudson Card has a very similar skill set to McCoy. He's very good throwing on the move. He can hit those under really well, really accurately. To really come into his own, he needs to fix whatever mechanical issues are holding him back from being better in a deep passing game. He's got probably a stronger arm than Colt McCoy. So his upside there is theoretically higher in the regard of being able to push it down the field, but it's not actualized yet in terms of skill. This is why he's behind Quinn Ewers, I think, in in terms of who to expect to start next season. In a spread passing game, in an RPO passing game, deadly, throwing, spraying the ball around to guys underneath in position to go make plays after the catch. He might still be another year or two or development away from really being able to show people what he could do. But I think if he were at a school like um, Kansas State, Texas Tech, um, with their new offense, TCU, what have you, he would just be terrifying before he was done because he has all those classic Big 12 things, but he has greater arm strength and a greater de- a greater degree of physical athleticism than the guys of the past that we've seen. And of course, we have to talk about offensive line before we can really see how we can maximize all of our weapons. Do you think the offensive line room improves from last year if we do end up adding a couple freshmen? In order just to match last year on the offensive line, they needed to find a new Derek Kerstetter. And if they could do that between either Jones getting better, Christian Jones, uh, Andre Karik, or uh, Hayden Connor, if one of those guys could make a leap to Kerstetter level solid tackle, then I thought they'd have a chance to be at least as good as last year before you add any freshmen. Probably potentially better because everybody else theoretically improves at least a little bit. Majors, Angola, whoever. Adding the freshmen, which I think they are pretty much a lock to do, I'd say the main difference is you add a level of athletic upside that simply does not exist in the returning guys. A lot of the athletic upside types of guys that Tom Herman signed were like Jalen Garth, who tore up his knees and is like struggling to get back to it. Isaiah Hookfin, who's now, I believe, on medical scholarship because of the car accident. And uh, Tyler Johnson just didn't really pan out. So everyone else that Herman signed was like, not the athletic upside NFL type tackle. That guy doesn't exist on the roster. I Christian Jones, I guess, but that has just really not materialized. I believe they'll end up starting at least one freshman, likely two. We'll get into that in a moment, I think. And at least one freshman tackle, I think, will start. And probably from the beginning of the season, kind of depending on what they want to do with Hayden Connor. So I, I, for, I foresee the unit being more athletic than a year ago. I think that the unit we saw at the end of the year that was more consistently good in the run game is going to be the unit that we see much earlier in this coming season. For some of the same reasons, one is that they'll be more cohesive and, and developed within the scheme and working together. And then secondly, um, at the end of the year, when Bijan Robinson went out of games, teams started to just focus on Xavier Worthy and uh, it opened up the run game. And I think teams are going to have to try to key in on stopping the Texas pass game at large, which is going to, it's going to make the offensive line uh, look a lot better perhaps even than they are next season. I, I think fans will be, I think fans may be shocked at how much better the offensive line looks for much of the season, even if they're not actually materially that much better, just because of uh, the greater offensive context. I think by mid season, it's going to look like from left to right, Banks, Angelau, Majors, Campbell, uh, unless Campbell it takes hold at tackle instead of guard and then just flip him and Connor. That, that'd be my guess. That's my exact lineup as well. And we do know that the running back room is stacked. Do you think we see more two back stuff utilized? I think that they're going to start from a position of we want to play with 20 personnel more often. I think uh, Rashawn Johnson was so good at the end of last year, and he's such a leader behind the scenes that they're just going to want to get him on the field regularly. 
knowing Sark, I imagine the way they're going to do that is by packaging the offense. Maybe they run some 10 personnel with all these receivers and he's the running back instead of Bijan because he can protect better than Bijan. Probably a lot of two back stuff. Um, and of course they can always shuffle Bijan and Roshan as the single running back that can shuffle them in and out for each other. But Bijan Robinson's the best player on the team. So if you want to have a sizable role for Roshan as the leader of the team, that means you need them both on the field at the same time. Ultimately, the, the way they're going to have to do that, obviously, is with two back sets. And with the added influx of talent at wide receiver, how will that affect our passing game? What can we do this year that we struggled to do last season? Texas can really do whatever they want if their main guys are healthy. Um, main guys, by that I mean Isaiah Nayor, Xavier Worthy, and in particular Jordan Whittington because he's had injury issues in the past. Jordan Whittington could be the ultimate version of how Tom Herman used the slot receiver in his offense. Isaiah Nayor could be a version of how Tom Herman used Colin Johnson in his offense. You could do both of those things, like when tech in those moments when Texas had a, a little Jordan Humphrey and Colin Johnson both healthy, or Devin Duvernay, Colin Johnson. And both healthy, but because you have Isaiah Nayor outside as well, and you have a stronger, more accurate downfield passer in Quinn Ewers, you can open up a whole nother dimension to the offense as well. Um, it's very common these days for split field coverage defenses, meaning that the defense has half their secondary play one way and half their secondary play another. A lot of defense will, will like to do like a, they'll play one deep safety over the deep threat receiver and be playing a conservative coverage, but on the other side of the field, be playing an aggressive coverage with the safety like down in the box or near the box. And uh, you cannot do that if the quarterback can throw vertical routes to the field and he has a deep threat receiver out there and in the boundary who you cannot cover one-on-one. -on -one. So that's kind of the big, the big question for Texas that I think they will pass and will be the reason why they are devastating next year is they can put Nayor and Worthy on opposite ends of the field. It's either play two safeties way over the top and get gashed by Bijan or it's play one safety and hope you don't get burned for quick scores to the Nayor or uh, Worthy or do everything you can to confuse the quarterback so he doesn't know who will be where. That'll probably be, that's, that last option is probably what teams will settle on. And then you have Tariq Milton added to the slot with the young Brennan Thompson who are both fast guys. And then you add Hall on the outside who can take it over the top with Kane coming on during the spring. And it seems like teams will have a lot to deal with even when the starters are off the field. So how do you think the second string drop-off is compared to last year? Uh, it'll be way different, I think. Last year, um, I think I underestimated how bad the wide receiver injuries were. Obviously, when they lost Jordan Whittington, they just like could not overcome that. They didn't have anybody else that was reliable in the slot. And they had a, a quarterback with limited arm strength, whose arm strength also vacillated from week to week based on how his thumb felt, I guess. And so they were really put in a box. Casey Kane, it seems like had already surpassed Marcus Washington and perhaps Calvante Dixon, uh, at least in terms of just being like, I, I, I don't know if he has quite the same explosiveness as say Dixon, but in terms of being like a reliable backup who, who will, who's willing to block, who has reliable hands, knows how to run the routes. On top of that, they just added potentially found money with a Jai Hall, who's a freak athlete, and uh, Tariq Milton, who used to be a freak athlete, may or may not still be. I'm actually not sure. But if he is, then that's a nice little upside off the bench. Brandon Thompson coming in as a freshman. Troy and Mary, if he's healthy. Jaden Alexi, if he's healthy. I think just between the transfers and the development of Casey Kane, they're better at backup receiver than they were last year. Probably count Jaleel Billingsley in this category as well. Not only are they, I think, a little deeper and a little more injury proof, but they also have major upside in development potential for the future with, uh, you know, Hall, if he can buckle down and embrace one school in a role. Exciting group to watch. And then tight ends have some promise this season as well. With added weapons in that room, do you think we see a lot of 12 personnel? I think they're going to use it some, probably a fair bit. I don't think they'll use it as much as last year because of uh, they're going to want to run the two back stuff with Rashawn Johnson. If you play in 12 personnel, you do not use a slot receiver. So you're either taking Jordan Whittington off the field or you're moving him outside and you're taking out Isaiah Nayor or Xavier Worthy. It's not that exciting to remove any of those three receivers from the field, honestly. Uh, they will play 12 personnel, I'm sure. You're going to want to have packages and they, they're probably going to have some 12 personnel packages with Gunnar Helm, JT Sanders on the field at the same time. Maybe three tight end sets, throwing Billingsley in there as well. 
just so you can uh, muscle teams and short yardage or whatever. They can build endless packages for this team, but I don't think it'll be quite the same as last year. Last year they had to play. If Kay Brewer was not on the field, they were in potentially big trouble because their tackles were, they just needed help. Um, and it really limited their run game and what they could do with Bijan if they didn't have Kay Brewer on the field. And Jared Wiley helped some as well, just in extending fronts and creating more opportunities for Bijan. I don't think it went quite as well as they wanted it to, but it was like essential last year in a lot of, in a lot of instances for them to be able to get heavy, kind of try to force the issue with Bijan until they beat TCU. This year, I think they could do that and they could do it better than they did last year, but they can do so many other things that are so much more explosive that I don't think it'll have quite the same role in the offense. And then out of all the position groups, who do you think will be the most improved? Most improved position group from 2021 to 2022. This is a little bit tricky just because you have to consider what was before and what will be there now. So immediately you think about quarterback because uh, Texas was, I mean, there were games where Casey Thompson was lighting people up. And then there were games where he was like, you know, one for six and had to be pulled out. That could be an enormous, enormous difference at quarterback. Probably the most obvious and significant one too, just because of viewers. Just you're replacing a uh, often beat up, basically average Big 12 quarterback with potentially a generational passer, potentially massive leap there. I think tight end is actually significantly better because JT Sanders showed in the spring game, he knows how to block and he's willing to do it. And he's a just an unreal receiver uh, on a different level than anyone Texas has had since Jermichael Finley left for the early for the NFL and, and Blaine Erby blew out his knee. I kind of want to say wide receiver though, ultimately, just because they might go from having two promising young potential future NFL type guys and one who was injured most of the season in Worthy and Whittington to having as many as three guys who could be drafted after this year if it goes well. So let's say wide receiver. That's my pick as well. And then you wrote an article the other day on the new S&P Plus rankings that dropped, and Texas predicted to have the 19th ranked offense. Do you think we end up lower or higher than that? I think they will be higher. I like to look at whether or not an offense can overstress and attack a defense and whether they can do that <clears throat> like regardless of opponent. So there are like there are offenses that will invariably be in the top of uh, SP plus like say like um, like one of Cliff Kingsbury's Texas Tech teams. He would build teams all the time where if you could not deal with their pace and passing they're just going to drop like 50 points on you. But if they did meet the team that could play like you know dime and rush the passer they could potentially just be like shut down or destroyed. By any statistical measure, that other that offense is going to be rated higher. But I, I prefer the offense that will score, you know, 30 points on the bad team, but will still score 25 points on the great defense. And I think actually Texas is going to be closer to that this season. They might have some diminishing returns against top elite defensive lines. So that will be potentially something that keeps them out of like, say, the top five, depending on how the offensive line comes together. We'll see how that looks against Alabama, obviously. But otherwise, I think they have so many weapons that they're going to be harder to shut down than any other unit in the Big 12. Awesome, brother. Always love when you come on and we can dive a little deeper into the X's and O's. Please let the beautiful viewers out there know where they can find your latest work and how to track you down on Twitter. Everybody find me on Inside Texas, blogging regularly there on the message boards covering Texas. Sometimes we get into some Big 12 stuff as well. Or you can follow me on Twitter at Ian underscore A underscore Boyd, the uh, special assistant to the special assistant to the head coach. And that is a wrap on the knowledgeable Ian Boyd. Make sure to check out his latest writings over on Inside Texas. It's always worth the subscription. Thanks for hanging out. Watch some more of my videos here. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and share if you want to support quality Texas content. As always, welcome.